Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. I have been waiting for this conversation for a long time. It's long overdue. And it's funny because the gentleman who's sitting across from me was in a completely different situation when I first asked him to come onto the podcast. <laughs> but he has grown significantly over the last year and has made quite a few dramatic pivots, especially <laughs> right. from our college days. I'm sitting here with Lionel Miranda. He is the founder of Spotlight Entertainment and also an artist of two different aliases, L. Rich and Leo Sounds. What's, What's up, man? On? Hello, hello. We're finally here doing this. I know. What was it, a year ago almost when we were first talking about me getting on the podcast? Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually glad we waited. There's a lot more to talk about today and... Um, the journey of what was going on back then and um, obviously what I have to pivot to um, in the current day. Right. So excited to chat with you. Co COVID will, is going to go down as one of the most introspective times in right. human history. I've had so many friends. I just tweeted about this other day. I've had, I've met probably 10 to 15 people over the last six months who've quit their jobs or just made a dramatic pivot because I think as we sat in quarantine for two months, a lot of us realized that we didn't want to be in the hospitality industry. Yeah. Or for you, in the very early days, you were part of the Just College team, which yes. is now Pollen, yeah. which has grown dramatically as well. Um, at that point, for me, I don't know if I really had an option. <laughs> at some point, like entertainment industry or events were just non existent. So <laughs> you are actually thinking, what's your next step already? <laughs> and, and when it came to just college, you were like one of the very first employees, right? Yeah. When they moved their office down to Vegas um, and I got hired, I think I counted 12 employees total at the time that were full-time. Yeah. And we, we had Bo on here earlier, who's one of the co-founders, but yes. that company is huge now. Yeah. Listen to Bo's episode. That mm. was a good one. It was awesome to reminisce on that. I texted him right after like, yeah, <laughs> got me all thinking about the old days and whatnot. It is just like, just like our college days over at UNLV. Yeah. We'll probably, we'll probably do some reminiscing ourselves. Right. <laughs> well, well, Lionel was actually like a, a huge leader in the Greek life community. He was president of Pike. Also, I think you're on IFC at one point, right? Um, no, not necessarily IFC, but yeah, I would go to the president meetings and, and chime in where I could try to get things moving on campus and vote on different events and whatnot. Do you, not, not direct correlation on the IFC. Do you feel like your leadership in Greek life helped you find your way throughout life afterwards? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, I am uh, I don't regret taking leadership positions at, at UNLV within the Greek community. Fix this just a little bit. Gotcha. Go. Um, yeah, I mean, before I even got to school, I never even knew what Greek life was. And then I learned that there were positions and it ran like a business. Um, the fact that I actually took the next step to get involved in those um, was awesome because everything did come full circle when I started my own business and got into a career. Um, I kind of had a, I would say, a leg up and a head start on the mentality and the structure I needed to move forward when I got into um, organizations beyond um, fraternity. Right. Once yes. you get once you get past that negative stigma of people saying pay for your friends, yeah, then you realize that there is a huge surplus of, of benefits when it mm -hmm. comes to Greek life. And something that I try to tell a lot of people when it came to, to Greek life, yes, you're paying, you know, 400 or $600 a semester, quote unquote, yeah, paying UNLV. for your friends at UNLV, <laughs> but, but you're basically pooling money with all of your friends to go out and do activities philanthropically, or just if you want to go out and party and socialize, yep. it's no different than now when you go to a music festival or just go on a international trip with your friends, you all pool money to figure out what you want to do. It's like almost yeah. exactly the same thing. Yeah. Bachelor party. That's kind of similar, right? Everyone mm -hmm. has a budget yeah. putting that money together. You kind of pick in the itinerary of what you guys are going to do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a reason why the majority of presidents have been a part of Greek life in some sense or another, whether it's a social fraternity or a special interest fraternity. Oh, as that, well. that is right. Right. I think there was only like two or three presidents since the 1900s that were not a part of Greek life. Interesting. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a leadership potential, but we'll move forward a little bit to the pandemic, right? You yeah. found yourself pretty much out of a job or temporarily out of a job. Yeah. Events were closed. The strip was closed down. And then you made this completely dramatic pivot, which we had talked about when we had met up right when COVID started, you were helping produce events. And then all of a sudden you became the artist and entertainer. Yeah. Like what transpired from, from those events and was L rich and Leo sound something you had always thought about? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, 
with with the just college team right post college i got involved in actually it was during college is when i got involved with the promotions of events um i started off with swat everyone um, remembers that yeah. have a sue yeah so summer winter action tours i don't know if people knew what that actually <laughs> stood for um i was with them promoting i think a soft end of freshman year and then junior year i started working with a promoter called just college um and then basically after I was wrapped up with school in a sense, I was hired full time to work with them. And I was working with them from August, 2014, all the way basically until this past June, I'd say is when I finally got furloughed. Um, as everybody can remember in like February, <laughs> March area, things just started, started shutting down left and right. And, um, once that June furlough came around, I had my summer open and, and um, I was able to pick up on a project that I had started back in like high school, right? So I was making music back in, I would say freshman year. Um, I started producing um, sophomore year, junior year. I was still writing music, like full length songs. I just never really was putting them out once I got to college um, because once college started, I was focused on um, well, like, like what you were saying, school ultimately was my first priority. Second, um, I was taking leadership roles within um, Greek life. I was involved with Rebel Recycling, playing tons of intramural sports. So I was very highly, like what you are mentioning, highly involved in the campus community, which um, in essence didn't free up a lot of time for my personal endeavors. So once I got into the career, um, that was actually even more busy than what school was working 60 hours a week, traveling half of the year, um, to promote these shows that are happening in not only Vegas, but Cancun, Cabo throughout Canada and so on. Um, so when I had that freedom, um, I definitely took advantage of it and started making music again. Um, which is kind of a blessing in disguise because who knows when I would have actually picked that back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I remember when we met for lunch, right. When the pandemic started, because we wanted to create a networking group for the city for entrepreneurs and yep. people our age, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into. It's something that we still want to do. Yes. You, you told me that you almost felt not embarrassed to promote it publicly, but you felt like there was almost a conflict of interest in, in some sense of, pursuing this musical career while promoting events. Can you touch a little bit on that idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think actually is more so a fear. Um, right. There was a song that I put out called Darwin's law. That's um, my favorite one. Thank you. We could talk about that one more in depth too today if you want, but I'm talking about like how I was brought up, um, different struggles that I had to endure as, uh, with my family um, in school with drugs and alcohol. And I suppose if I were to put those things out there and make it public, and I was a leader within an organization that partners with several large businesses throughout the States and internationally, um, I didn't want them to see or hear those stories about me and then think differently of me when I'd go into a business meeting, um, or hold that against me when I was trying to pursue new partnerships or business uh, development endeavors. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, that and then also putting out music is just scary in it overall. I'm sure you've had many artists on here. Um, and if you, I don't know if you talk to them about it on your show, if you actually ask them later on, if they, when they put out their first project, um, it's not always easy. I think even for you, I watched your first initial mm -hmm. guest list podcast, YouTube video where you're talking about how like, you don't know if it's going to be good, bad, but you'll pivot along the way and it'll eventually become what it's supposed to be. But the, the point of it is that you just start. Um, and that starting that first step is actually quite scary. So that was another fear in itself. And how yes. did it, how did it feel once you got over it? Did it, did you learn from, I don't know, learn from your own mental aptitude that maybe this fear is something that shouldn't exist. Oh yeah. It's definitely something that I made up in my head. Right? Isn't that strange? I always, yeah. I always use the mental model of like the, <laughs> these, these obstacles, these mental obstacles that we put in the way, they seem like these walls are literally tens of feet or hundreds right. of feet high. 
And then once you finally get over, you look at it, and it's literally just like a step. You're just like walk, like stepping over a fence or yeah. a picket fence, and it's uh, you know you have this thing where uh, what are people going to think about the music or the videos or the podcast that I'm making? You know, you, you see yourself on camera. A lot of people don't even like seeing themselves on camera. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I don't even like hearing myself. Um, which is weird as a recording artist. I don't like my <laughs> own voice, um, but I think that I think that tends to be um, pretty normal for people not to like their own voice. It's just um, tough getting used to, I suppose. But once you get in your groove, you get a little rhythm. You and and then also what helps a lot is the acceptance of other people saying, "Wow, that was actually pretty cool," or "Keep going." You know, some people might not think it's the best yet, but as long as you personally know it's going to continue to get better, um, I think that's a step in the right direction. And you learn that the majority of the majority of people do support you. Usually when you first start a new endeavor, you'll receive a lot of attention in the beginning. Yeah. Right. My first two episodes had like almost 200 downloads. And then there was a huge drop off right after yeah. that for a few months because then your supporters want to see if you're consistent. And that's where a lot of creators and entrepreneurs feel loneliest because yeah. you, that is re it is really just you and obviously you're loyal, your supporters, but they're, they want to see the consistency from you. Yeah. And That's, I'm still glad I'm dropping music till this day. <laughs> I actually have something coming out this Friday. <laughs> did you have, when you put out your first song, did you have a set plan in terms of like your release dates and how you wanted to go about building L Rich and Leo Sounds and then eventually Spotlight Entertainment. Yeah, yeah. So for L Rich, um, the name basically derived from my Instagram handle, Lionel Richie, <laughs> um, which I've rebranded recently. Obviously, I couldn't have stuck with the Lionel Richie for the rest of my life and just bite the actual mm -hmm. Lionel Richie himself, um, who I'm actually named after. Wow. Um, and basically, when I got Instagram, I'd say like either like towards the end of high school or the beginning of college, I didn't really have a name to go with. And I would always tell people like Lionel and they'd be like, who? I'd be like, like Lionel Richie. Um, these days in 2021, if I were to tell that to someone who's like 21, like work in the register at like a, uh, at like a restaurant and they're asking, oh, what's the name for the order? I'm like Lionel, like Lionel Richie. These days they're like, who the, what are you talking about? <laughs> so... Um, but that's what I used to say, like, like Lionel Richie and people like, Oh, like Nicole Richie's dad. <laughs> if they were like a little younger, older crowd would definitely know what I was talking about. And so I said, okay, I'll just do Lionel Richie as my handle with two E's at the end. <laughs> and I had that for over a decade. Um, and eventually even like some of my friends in the circle would just shorten it down to L rich. Um, people were actually like writing me like handwritten notes, um, or like pieces of mail, like friends that I had made from traveling um, would like write me your postcard and on the actual envelope, they would, wouldn't even know my last name. They would just have it as Lionel Richie on the envelope. That's, super it just funny. became like a normal thing. R so when R I, <laughs> right. That's like right before we started interviewing, I was like, do you want me to introduce you as Lionel Miranda or Lionel Richie? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, totally cool with both. And, uh, um, I'm just glad I was able to just take that and shorten it to L rich. Um, from there, I had planned a release date and it was last year, July 3rd, 2020. So almost a year ago from today. And um, yeah, exactly a month and two days short. So I chose July 3rd because I knew that people would want some new music to listen to over the July 4th weekend, but it wasn't like too crazy of a holiday. It was more so like kick, kick back in your backyard, barbecue, hang by the pool. And so it's like, all right, if you're on your phone and you see me promoting it, you might actually turn it on your Bluetooth speaker instead of you listening it by yourself. Hopefully you're with like five to 10 friends and I can get that whole audience right there done. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you've made a little bit of a splash in the, in the local scene. Um, you've also networked and partnered with some of my previous guests on the show, right? You mm -hmm. went on Bianca McCall's podcast. You yeah. work with For the Culture with Rex and Paul. There's mm -hmm. probably a few other ones that I'm missing in there. What is, what is your, now that you've, it's been almost a year that you've been integrated into the, the local independent artist economy. What is your perception of it? Do you think there's a lot of room to grow and um, how, how are you going to make your impact? Um, yes, the culture is still growing here. Um, I think you and I have had this conversation over lunch or something where um, Vegas, I, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, I don't think Vegas has the um, has reached its peak in creativity um, exposed beyond Vegas, right? So 
if you're thinking of music cities that are cities that are popular for music throughout the United States, a lot of things that come to mind are like Nashville, Austin, um, which I think is like one they consider maybe the live music city or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, L.A. is big on music. New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta. Um, but when you think of Vegas, I don't think you think of music right away. Um, you barely started thinking of sports until recently when you thought of Vegas. Um, so in my personal opinion, there's a lot of room for growth, not only for me, but for the city as a whole um, and their independent artists out here. So with that said, I, for me, it's been an awesome experience connecting with other artists, um, sharing each other's network, followers, um, kind of promoting one another, right? Someone's dropping in a new song, a new song or, or doing a show. I can repost their stuff and in return, they do me favors. Um, and it's actually not even like spoken. It's just kind of un, it's an unspoken kind of, uh, trade off between people that you've created, I've created relationships with. Um, and I think as that continues to grow and we use teamwork in the city versus competing, um, we can help grow each other's networks, help the culture expand, um, and, you know, trade off YouTube subscribers, Instagram followers, and it's, so on. It's really tough at first to figure it out. But when you have that that unison of social support, especially yeah. on social media, um, you feel more confident in the direction that you're going. And together, I do believe that together is how the tide, the tide rises, right? Yeah. Um, Vegas is small enough to where you can have a dramatic impact on whatever ecosystem you want to, whether it's politics or entertainment or I don't know, any sort, any sort of various interest. So that's why I always preach about the creative economy being more of a collaborative effort than it is a tribal competitive nature. Right. Um, there's, there still should be some competition though, right? You want to make a better song than the person for you or even compete with yourself, make a better song than lo- your last one. Um, and I think that's healthy to keep people um, on their toes with bringing something unique to the table. Um, and you were saying something about uh, like bringing each other together. Um, there's something that I'm doing right now. I'm actually filming a music video tonight. Nice. Yeah, so Let's after go. I leave here, going to start prepping for that. The shoots from 5.30 to 7.30 tonight. It's actually down here in the Arts District. Um, what I'm doing is bringing together a local media team. Um, so uh, videographers, um, behind-the-scene photographers. We're shooting in front of murals downtown. Um, Sean Keith is um, one of the guys over on – he has a mural on Main in Charleston. No, no, no. I think it's Casino, Casino Center in Charles- Charleston, right? The new one. Yeah, I posted yeah. some Instagram pictures in front of it. Yeah, and I'm actually working with the restaurant right now doing some media, and he actually did the artwork at the restaurant. Um, they're not open yet. And so I was like, okay, I'm running into this guy everywhere. Um, let's shoot in front of his mural and then get him posted and get him some exposure. Um, we're also shooting some of the music video inside of Recycled Propaganda. So, Very popular place. Yeah, so they, they're putting on for many artists out here. Um, they're an art gallery themselves and hopefully you can catch some of their artwork or other individuals artwork that is inside of recycled propaganda, um, gallery and people can see their art in the background of the music video. Um, there's also break dancers involved, freestyle dancers involved, um, millennium dance studio is a big studio, uh, dance studio here in it Las might Vegas. might be the most popular one. Oh, oh, so you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've had four girls from there who have been working two weeks on choreographing um, a dance to my song. Um, so, but the theory is, is that like we're shouting them out. We're promoting them, the, the break dancers, the artists, um, the photographers, the videographers, everyone's kind of on this Vegas movement. Um, when I was pitching it, the idea to them, it's like, all right, I want the dance community to be put on, right? Mm-hmm. I want you, the um, the guy who's doing the mural in the background to get exposure. Um, so beyond just myself, let's work together. Let's all promote the uh, the video and get eyes on not only myself, but all of us. Right. It's a, it's yes. a targeted, targeted effort. Yeah. It's very similar to what I do with the podcast where yeah. it's like, 
you don't have to reach out to these people who have 50,000, 100,000 followers because we're just trying to target the area of Vegas. And then once you kind of have that commandeered, then you can expand outwards. Yeah. But if you have 20 people from the same city who all have different interests, share that video or that post, then it's going to have a higher concentration rate yeah. to, to the people that you want to reach and then have those people reach out to you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, it has some good results and we've been putting a lot of work into it. Like I was mentioning, they've been practicing for two weeks, right? And so shout out to them. I like the idea of the collaborative effort from these different communities. Um, we had this conversation a few weeks ago in your studio, which is also in the arts district yep. about spotlight entertainment and like how you're trying to set yourself up differently from a lot of these other the definition you have for it is licensed provider, professional DJs, photographers, and videographers for all occasions, right? Yep. Like there are tons of DJ providers across the city, um, but you you add, you add, added the additional of photographers and videographers and maybe eventually dancers and things like that. Yeah. So is that how you intend to separate yourself differently of Spotlight Entertainment from some of these other just DJ gig bookers yeah bookies. i mean uh one thing i noticed that i'm not doing that they are is like promoting their own events with their collective of djs um that's something i'll get into obviously i have experience in hosting events um over a decade's worth um so i think it's something that's obtainable for me um but at that point i'd need to build a team to help run the door promoter network of uh, street team that can help sell tickets to the events and whatnot um, and really kind of put some DJs on that way. Um, and then obviously we'd use our photographers and media team to um, shoot the the event and the recap videos. But I think the one thing that's really setting Spotlight apart potentially from others is this theory that I have of um, people who've been wanting to do art full time for a long time right? Whether it be their videography or DJing. Um, I think when you graduate from high school, it's a very common thing that, um, your parents, your friends, parents, they all kind of ask them like, what college are you going to? What four year university are you going to attend? And sometimes some of these people actually didn't want to attend, um, a university. They actually wanted to focus on, on their craft the whole time. Maybe they've been doing videos since high school, but then now they end up at a four-year university taking like a, who knows, or a degree that they might not end up using. <laughs> yeah, that's why they end up dropping out or having seven different major right. changes because nothing interests them. It's kind of been exactly. just forced upon them. I mean, you can take a video um, degree, right? But or, you don't necessarily need it yeah. to succeed. For example, you don't you don't need to go to a D, four-year DJ school to become a DJ. You, if you were DJing in high school, you probably already knew how to. Now... If you wasted four years fo focusing 80% of your attention on something else, then you just took away from four years worth of ex ex being able to excel your DJ career. Um, so I was even in that predicament growing up where kind of like all my friends are going to colleges and I wanted to pursue music. And the reason why I chose to go to college instead was I felt the pressure of everyone else's parents asking me and then what people were like looking at me as at the time. I'm glad that I even got in because like I, I used FAFSA to kind of get me in there. But when I did get in, I realized there was another aspect of networking that can um, help my career as well. So that definitely worked in my favor tenfold. Um, but uh, long story short is if I had just focused on music for that, I, it actually took me six years. <laughs> I was five and a half years, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if I had focused on music for that six years, I think I've been making great progress w within this last year. Um, but if I had another six years under my belt, where could I have been? Um, so my thing is for this endeavor for Spotlight is can I eventually get enough um, connections or plugs throughout the valley to where people are shooting film so much that they can quit their job elsewhere and then their their craft becomes their full-time thing and then potentially driving Uber is their part-time thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of like what I did, take the leap, but it's easier 
said than done. So I really wanted to be the um, kind of lead or story or role model on that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you want to be, yeah. it sounds like you want to be a little bit of an intermediary for all of these different creative outlets yeah. to where you can, somebody can approach you and say, Hey, I want to do this music video. I need dancers, photographers, yeah. videographers, a DJ, maybe a band or something like that. Yeah. And you can help assist in that progress to piece it together Yeah, or something, you know, a little bit more obscure, like, Hey, we're going to go, I don't know. We're going to go out to searchlight and we're going to have some sort of drag race and we yeah. need different people there to help shoot it and drones and whatever. And yeah, you could just provide everything in one. Package, you provide everything. And it's kind of hard out here in Vegas as well, because I've, I've brought this message up a handful of times. It seems like all of the different entrepreneurs kind of work in silos. Like everyone kind of like is so intently focused on their own craft. They don't really reach out and collab with everyone else. Yeah. So it becomes a that. little bit hard to define who's actually out there. Like I know Vegas has 400,000 photographers, yeah. right? But if you had them all under one roof and if, if you specifically knew all of their strengths and weaknesses and somebody approached you and said, Hey, I need a photographer for modeling yes. or for a wedding or something like that, you have the ability to help assist in that process to make sure that it's the right selection. That is correct. So yeah, that's the other aspect of it. So uh, to get back to what I was saying, uh, the, 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 what you were mentioning was like a collective of DJs kind of focus on DJs. Right. And then you're mentioning what's a little bit different is that I added the photographers and videographers as well. Um, that is one of the differences. And then the other was, I truly like, I was talking to one of the DJs yesterday, like asking him, how can we get you more gigs to the point where you can quit your job and just do what you want for a living? Um, so that was the other aspect that I was trying to really get after. But, um, what's up guys. We're going to take a quick 60 second break to give a shout out to the first ever sponsor of the guestless podcast. And you guessed it. It's none other than manscaped. <laughs> Manscaped is the most popular man men's grooming product in the world. It is something that I live by. Um, I make sure that I use it before I go out and hit downtown Vegas, Fremont Street, go down to the Strip. It's something that gives me more confidence to go out and have a good night. And as we know, Father's Day is right upon us. And what a better gift than to get your father his very own Manscaped. And if you use the code the guest list at manscaped.com, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. Once again, that's 20% off and free shipping. And if you don't feel comfortable getting your father one of the most popular men's grooming products, they do offer a few other select products as well. They have a nose trimmer, they have ball wipes, they have a crop mop, they have cologne. You guys could go over to that website. They have some, some underwear, which I'm currently wearing right now, or you could get a cool shirt like this that I'm wearing as well. They have the whole package. So once again, make sure that you guys go to manscaped.com. Use the code, the guest list. You guys are listening to the guest list. Very simple. Use the promo code, the guest list to receive 20% off and free shipping to anywhere in the United States. Thank you guys for listening. And let's get back to the show. Now switching and transitioning to what you're talking about is if you know all of the best in X industries or this industry, right? Photography. And you know, all the wedding photographers or the food photographers or the modeling photographers, and someone's reaching out to you with a specific budget and a specific need. Um, you can now condense the need and then know who is within that budget and then get them in contact with someone that's going to be able to suffice um, their needs right away versus them doing, uh, you know, hours of research and then talking to someone that's probably not the best fit for that project or not within their budget that they're looking for. It's, it's so, t it's so tough nowadays. Yeah. Um, we are kind of YouTube and, you know, Instagram influencers and internet personalities have kind of been around for 10 years, but they really started taking massive publicity over the last maybe four or five. Yeah. And I think that trend is just going to continue. And eventually as a lot of 
normalized jobs become automated away. We see this happening with the service bartenders and the some of the front desk employees. You're going to need to have some sort of creative outlet and you're going to be able you're going to need the ability to take your job or your profession and basically be like a nomad and go on the road and be able to plug and play in different areas. So you're you're on the definitely on the right track to do that because I don't I haven't seen anyone else out in Vegas kind of becoming that directory. Um, yeah. for that. It's almost like a creative Craigslist directory in a yeah, sense. I mean, here's the thing that could also eventually be automated and then, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, so everything can, can move into tech. Um, I'm trying to figure that out too. No, yeah. <laughs> Obviously it could be automated away, but as we we're saying, we're kind of on the, the foundation yeah. of culture Yeah, and nobody has really put the work in to figure it out. That's yeah. why I mean, you have, we've had this conversation on a handful of occasions, right? It's like, Kind of, I'm doing the same thing where there was, I sat around and waited for two years for somebody to do this podcast to basically create a tool for all of the different leaders in the city who are doing something yeah. to come on and be basically be like a, a personality directory is essentially kind of what I'm doing. Yep. And now you're, you're taking the opposite approach where you're being a creative directory for, for the locals. I like that. Right. I didn't think about it like that, but I am now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that our city needs. If we're in this, as Paul and I have talked about, which you're friends with, we mm-hmm. talked about Vegas being in the golden age of culture. There's people who have to basically just bear the brute or do the extra effort to figure this all out. But yeah. the only way we do it is in a collaborative effort. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's kind of brings me back to what I was talking about is I don't think Vegas has reached that peak where we are established as a creative city. Um, or when you think of, you know, music or even tech, you don't think of Vegas being the hub for that, but there are people that are working in the background who are eventually going to bring something together. That's going to, uh, make a name for us. We're just a very new city. So, um, it's coming down to, um, the leaders who are going to make an impact. And I think you call them the movers and shakers. Yeah. I really uh, like that term. Yeah, man. It's, <laughs> it's, I'm having a blast doing this. Um, you get to wake up every day and you kind of have a general routine, but you never know who's going to reach out to you. You never know what's going to happen, what event might surface. And that's, that's the fun part because when we, if we fast forward 10 years from now and look back and see this giant movement that we've built, that's the journey that we're going to embrace. And it, it brings us to all these different opportunities. You're, you're rocking a, we, the beat shirt, which I just had Kirk on here recently. <laughs> yeah. So obviously that's even diving into the event space, Yeah, which there are thousands of different event companies in Vegas, but they, I would say probably 80 or 90% of them focus on the strip and yeah. the downtown and for the tourists, we, the beat focus on locals. And that's something Kirk and I talked about all the yeah. time. And so there's a lot of opportunity there because since they also function in Santa Barbara, they're going to need somebody to reach out to, to be like, Hey, we need a certain type of artist to come on, you know, with DJs or they go reach out to for the culture. And Paul's kind of doing a similar thing, but with like the, the rappers and the the hip hop kind of artists. Yeah. I mean, that's how Kirk and I started getting to work together. Mostly, Um, you know, two things was one when they were expanding to Vegas from Santa Barbara, um, we, the beat, they were looking for someone who had experience in promotions. Um, They actually reached out to my buddy Tyler. And then Tyler was like, I think you should be talking to Lionel. And this is at the time when I was like peak working with like SWAT and just college. So um, they were trying to get an in with UNLV and a bunch of the college students here in Vegas. And uh, it was easy for me to kind of take that on, especially for someone that was living in Santa Barbara for several years and went to school there. Um, how does he get that connection? Um, so it was awesome to partner with them right at the get go of their, um, uh, their start here in Las Vegas before even our first event. Um, and then moving forward, as the event started to happen, we were discussing, okay, well, we need additional venues. Um, we need, and this is kind of where spotlight kind of started in my head. We need DJs. We need a photographer. And I would always be like, okay, I know this guy, Jelani. Um, I think I introduced him to Anthony Wincoop and he had a, um, uh, st- music studio downtown. And eventually I had Kirk head over to that studio and then he met a bunch of those guys and they were a collective of DJs at the time. So as I was coming to these shows, I would see, okay, Anthony's opening. 
next one Jelani is opening. Um, Teddy and Sean are opening as Flash Gang. And it was cool to have made that connection. Um, I think uh, a guy named Zach McKee, his Instagram is spectacular. I love the media work he's, he's doing. He's a great photographer. And I met him through a UNLV Greek life, and they said we need some media people. I got them connected with Zach. Zach was doing photos for a few shoots, and all the work became, came out amazing. Um, so it's actually kind of uh, a foreshadow to kind of what I'm doing now. I've, back then, I was just kind of making the connections because I was involved with We The Beat, um, and now I'm kind of taking that on like full force. Yeah. It's, it's going through the motions, right? We, yeah. We're both very social people, but outside of being social people, we both have similar upbringings as we talked about your, your, your song, right? Darwin's law, mm-hmm. um, growing up with not much, right? A similar background, but having going through that experience, it teaches you how to be resourceful and yeah. that, that's how it's easy to make connections. Yeah. So, so do you, through connecting with people, do you do you get joy making those connections? Do you feel like you have a chip on your shoulder from growing up with not much? What what motivates you to continue this pursuit? Nice. That's uh, going to allow me to reminisce a little bit. Um, at my house growing up, that's where all the parties would happen. <laughs> so 4th of July, it would be like my neighbor and then my house kind of like open doors and like whoever wanted to come through on our street would just come in. There'd be music playing at both houses, food going on at both houses. Um, Whenever there was a celebration for like a birthday or something, my parents would host it at our house. And um, even for like holidays, when I was in elementary school, all of my cousins and stuff would be over. So it was super fun to watch my parents host, kind of cook food, cater food, have music provided, drinks flowing. Obviously, I was a kid, but um, I was watching this all unfold and how they kind of connected with people on my street, people from their work, people from my family, um, and extended friends, and just kind of always had them over at the house. I think that's something I've just been around and a part of um, since a very young age. So now kind of connecting with other people became very easy for me. And obviously that transition to me hosting events, like I said, for a decade and, and kind of being my, my part was lead like in promotions or, you know, kind of one of the managers on the sales team. So it was like, we are going out there. We're going to be bring people together and we're going to help them create memories that they otherwise wouldn't have with their best friends. And then other people from different networks that they would have never, ever met without this opportunity <laughs> so I'm sure just college and uh, Bo talked about that on his podcast, a bunch of just like building memories mm-hmm. um, for, for students. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it comes down to, man. It's those memories that you, that you create, especially when you're younger, you tend to reflect on them often, right? Because it's kind of the, the building blocks to the person that you exist today. Yeah. And, um, that's, I was the same, same situation growing up. Uh, my parents were always having, you know, little outings in the garage with their friends, drinking, playing classic rock music. And yep. that's kind of the reason why I listen to classic rock all the time. Cause it reminds me of like my childhood and them playing and just growing up and being very resourceful, learning how to communicate with the people that are around you and then finding the, the commonalities, right? Like, yeah. It's, it's a little bit different when you grow up, I wouldn't say privileged, but when you grow up having what you need um, in terms of, you know, a, a roof, like clothes and a roof over your head and like, su- like substantial finances, you don't have to go out and talk with anybody, right? Everything is kind of set for you. But when you grow up less privileged or less resourceful, you have to learn how to make friends. You have to learn that the person that's sitting across from you, you guys could both benefit off each other and that you can learn from each other to, to help propel you forward. So I, I do think like having this tough start is actually more of a superpower because I think it's like 65% of millionaires are all self-made <laughs> and that just speaks louder than anything to me. All right. So I had this funny thought the other day. Um, I bought a skateboard for my first time, um, like a full complete deck. And I'm 29 years old and I bought it, uh, like right after Christmas, it was a Christmas present to myself. 
Um, to think that I've skated my whole life from like third grade. I actually never bought skateboard. Every skateboard that I had from third grade up until whenever. I mean, I, I'm still skating till this day. Even my last skateboard that I got in my mid 20s was a hand me down board that I saw in my friend's garage. And I was like, hey, you still use this thing? Because, like, I know we're adults now. Like, most people don't skate anymore. He's like, dude, have it. Right. But even as a kid, um, neighbors from down the street, we'd be skating. And then my board would be getting old. I noticed they got a new one. I'm like, yo, can I get your old board? Like, is it cool with your parents? And then they were always cool with it. And um, I guess in return, they would always have someone to skate with. I don't know if there was really a trade-off there. <laughs> I, I definitely came up. <laughs> um, but it is, it's its using your resources, right? Because otherwise, that thing would have just been sitting in someone's garage. Mm -hmm. it, it would blew my mind to think that, like, I never actually bought my own board for 29 years, even though I skated for 20, like, 20 of those years. Isn't that wild? <laughs> it's Yeah. It comes down to building relationships. And I think that's why you and I are very similar because we actually find joy in connecting with people and building things, right? Because we've been discussing culture pretty much throughout this entire topic. Culture is built with the absence of money, right? The majority of cultures that were built were built on the foundation of friendship and trying to pass the time or build something substantial. Mm -hmm. And then the money kind of comes later and then just ruins everything right that's <laughs> i never actually thought about it like that you're educating me really well. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense though right that's what happened with with elvis coming in and stealing the the rock music from, <laughs> from black people the same thing no, no, with, just capitalizing off and monetizing uh, and off monetizing that, yeah. off and that it's the same thing look what happened with how we kind of became friends or closer is through the raves the rave scene right mm -hmm. player was like a big thing when we first started um the stages were much smaller. It wasn't yeah. as glamorized. And now you see it 10 years later and it's very commercialized. 100%. People are just going there to get fucked up. Like the, the authenticity of, and the, the free spirit of the festival has kind of been tainted a little bit because of so much money that's just interjected and yeah. trying to commercialize it. Definitely more popular now. <laughs> um, I mean, it was popular back then, but even for electronic music, when we first started, college even high school now going back to high school oh in like 26 two, no, it's not 26 2006 <laughs> right 2008 area it was underground and then i think edc came to vegas in what 2011 11 was first year. by 2013 it was pretty much on the radio mm -hmm. like electronic music per se and uh yeah what you were saying in recent day it's all about all right how can we monetize or turn a profit off this event? Mm -hmm. Which uh, that's kind of what they had to do before too, but it also was about the music purely as well. Yeah, and yeah. then once the DJs made them their way into the nightclubs and started seeing these crazy, crazy six-figure contracts for all these DJs and the, the bottle services and stuff kept like rising and rising and still rise to this yeah. day. You know, it's very lucrative, but being in that atmosphere for six years, you see the toxic toxicity behind it. Yeah. So that's why I have a lot of joy in doing what we're doing now. Right. It's kind of we, the absence of money is the missing part. So it makes me feel like we're actually building culture, especially down here in downtown in the arts district where you have a studio where, uh, for the culture has a studio where Daniel Bolgatz works out for, um, yep. for graffiti park, like all the different people I've had on here. I think that's why our generation kind of identifies down here because how packed does it get on the weekends down here? Like it's, it's crazy. It's insane. It's because there's no, I, I truly believe in my opinion that the arts district has found a lot of success recently is because there's no gambling down here. So it, it gets to be, it has the opportunity to be more authentic and kind of find its image and not be tainted by the, the addiction or I guess money because of that. Yeah. I can definitely see that. Mm -hmm. And the painters too. Creativity in, in his essence, right? Is yeah, that what I mean, that's what I wanted to come down here for. When I when I was first building the music studio, we were looking around town and um, we were looking at like Chinatown, a couple other spots. I was looking for something affordable. Obviously, I was taking a leap from my job to build a studio <laughs> and do this whole music thing. Um, and I was going for something somewhat affordable. Um, it didn't need to be too crazy big, but I wanted it to be in a cool spot of town. And once we saw the listing in the arts district and I was able to cruise by as a perfect size and then it was right around my budget and I was like, okay, I took a walk around the neighborhood, which I haven't really hung out around here much before moving 
um, my studio into the arts district. I didn't really hang out down here too much. And I came to realize like, damn, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on down here. Tons of artists who are working down here. Um, cool antique shops. There's not really a lot of corporate stuff. You don't find like a Taco Bell or McDonald's. It's like, um, mom and pop own bars and restaurants. And I really liked that, um, aspect of it. So as soon as I circled the block a few times and then I realized where my location would be, I was pretty much like, all right, if you can get a call back on Monday, um, to my, to my real estate broker, like just send everything you need to right away. Send it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly what I meant. Send it. Yeah. Your, stu- your, <laughs> your studio is awesome. Um, so we haven't got to cover a little bit of Leo sounds and we talked about L rich, uh, where does that fit into play in terms of just your, your overall mission? Yes. So spotlight is the agency for the DJs, photographers, videographers, kind of, um, playing, uh, you know, QB in a sense with the uh, partners there. Um, L rich is strictly like hip hop. Um, and then my artist alias for additional kind of music is Leo sounds. Um, Leo sounds is a DJ producer. Um, so if I'm D I've been DJing downtown pretty much two, three times a week. And, uh, at that point I'd not really going branding myself as L rich. Cause I'm not actually going there to like perform all of my original songs that I'm writing as L rich hip hop artist. So I just came up with that alias Leo sounds and that's kind of like my DJ name. Um, I've also been producing under that name for different artists and kind of working with individuals at my studio who come by and need some help with recording, um, what they call mix and masters, uh, making beats from scratch, and um, really kind of working with artists in Vegas that want to create a song Um, but necessarily can't necessarily find like an instrumental online that they like, they can come over to my, uh, to my studio and say, okay, I want it to be at this tempo in this key and kind of give this kind of feeling right. Happy or gloomy or sad, whatever it is. And then they can sit down with me at my workstation and then build what they were thinking of for their song from scratch. Um, so it's been cool to do that. I've worked with a couple, um, Dope artist out here. Um, one's name is APH. Um, he's got a decent following. He's been doing music for a while. Um, so very known in the local scene. He's got some songs with um, Lazy Bone from Bone Thugs of Harmony. Um, ben J from The New Boys, who did the uh, um, the Jerk song. I think they have like Don't Tie Me Down. Nice. Stuff like that. Um, another artist I worked with recently, her name is Weirdo. Um, so a, a L.A. born artist recently relocated to Vegas. Um, great singer. She's doing tons of like open mics and shows throughout Vegas right now. Every, pretty much every other night I see her Instagram and she's performing somewhere downtown or at the Artisan um, or this like dive bar in Boulder City even. So she's all over the map as far as the city goes. Um, so when I saw her playing like her guitar on her Instagram, I straight up DM'd her like, yo, I need to produce a beat for you. And it was awesome. She allowed me to work with her. And uh, another cool person, um, just to name a few more. (laughs) Um, Do you know who uh, John claude Van Damme is? Yeah. Yep. So he's like the fighter in all the old school movies. Yes. Uh, Met his son's producer and made a song with them. So the producer... Um, is a gentleman that lives out here. And then the vocalist was actually John Claude, John Claude Van Damme's son. Nice. Yeah. So um, connect with them through music, and they released that a couple of months ago. That's so meeting some cool people, having some cool people come into the studio, and then really getting to actually just like express my creativity um, by myself as L. Rich, and then with other people um, in tandem, like a collaboration of I work. S- to me, this is like, it's like a perfect, um, what is this uh, equal? What's the perfect three-sided triangle, equilateral triangle, something like that. And in, so. <laughs> in terms of, in terms of what you're doing, right? Like the spearhead of spotlight entertainment and then you have Elrich and Leo sounds and they all kind of supplement each other and yeah. work in unison. Yeah. I mean, I could have just branded it as like one thing. I don't know, but 
for me, I kind of had to separate it. Like one's a service, mm -hmm. right? One's this, one's that. So it actually took me some time to actually nail that down <laughs> because it's not easy to kind of create three different websites and mm -hmm. three different logos and kind of pick apart like, okay, what is this thing? And what is that thing's mission? What's this thing in definition? What is that thing's definition yeah, or, then, or mission? And then it's all, it's all semi-detached from your true identity, right? Lionel Miranda. Yeah. And that's something, that was an issue that I was facing as well with, with my podcast, right? I was like, okay, the guest list podcast. I'm also in crypto. Do I create a separate crypto account for my crypto tweets and interest? But then it's like, on my Twitter account, half of it's crypto, half of it's like podcasting and Vegas stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> well, will they work together? And then it's like at the end of the day for me, I was just like, I'd rather just house everything under my personal brand. And then if they like me, then they'll follow me for whatever the mission is that, yeah. that I'm portraying. Yeah, but, and you know, your crypto stuff gets big enough later, you could just always make a pivot and then separate it then. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. I'm full in now at this point. Like we're, run, <laughs> we're, run, we're running with it. I know pseudon <laughs> pseudonymity is super popular with, uh, with crypto, but... I've never been that way. I've been more, more in public, but reverting back, you said you've been DJing the last few weekends downtown. I know you're yeah. a park on Fremont and now we're recording today, June 1st, where Vegas is now officially a hundred percent capacity, a hundred percent, no mass anywhere. I when, brought my mask to your podcast. Literally <laughs> as I was walking out the door, I grabbed it just in case we ended up somewhere after this, like yeah. lunch or something. And I took, Man, it's June first already. Hundred percent. I went to the gym today without a mask. I was like, "Oh my god, this is nice." Totally forgot what this is like. Yeah. Have you seen an increase in demand for your services over the last few weeks? Yes. I mean, that's the reason why I took the leap from my full time job when I did. Right. I saw that places are at twenty five percent capacity like eight weeks ago, and I think I had my last official day with my old company was March 18th. Um, so it was at two and a half months out now from where we're at. The reason why I did that is because I knew from 25% is going to go to 30 and then 50 then 75 then hundred. And as those things were going to roll out, um, more people would start going out and then the entertainment for DJs and all that would start coming back. So I didn't want to really miss the mark to where I came out on June first and started introducing myself around town. I say I provide DJ services, and they're like, "Dude, our <laughs> whole residency or everything's booked up, man. Like the whole month is booked up." So, yes, things have picked up, and I I kind of strategically move myself into that momentum so I can get right into the action. Yes. Are you are you sticking to the downtown area? Are you trying to expand out? to the strip? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, I played on the strip before um, while I was working and DJing at the same time. Now that I'm DJing full time and then creating music and stuff full, st full time, um, I think it'd be, um, it's going to come back to where now I'm getting callbacks for the strip. Um, but the downtown area has been extremely fun. You know, Commonwealth, um, that place is always packed. So it was fun to play there. Park has been cool. Um, so shout out to corner bar management as a whole. I think they're just now partnering with, um, Ferguson's, they opened a new venue in area 15, um, which I'm going to go check out with some of my DJ buddies next week who they want me to get connected in there. And, um, I think they might even be opening up a few more venues throughout the year. Um, so it's kind of cool to be working with them. Um, Ferguson's, they just started their first ever music kind of series ever i think ferguson's i don't think they so did they dope. host a concert there before i don't think so but i just i just want to say ferguson's is like the new student union <laughs> every time i go there i run into somebody from unlv there and yeah. student union for those who know is like the area at unlv where basically all the greek life people hung out in the student union you'd like literally not just ditch class and just just hang on this yeah student union everyone would be in there to meet with people Mingling. yeah but every, every time i go to ferguson's now it's like i'm running into somebody from the unlv days yeah. which is cool because it means that we're in the right area and and they're trying to gain right. that attraction. Well, I mean, for those people who are listening um, that don't know what Ferguson's is, it's a what, it's kind, of, kind of like an amphitheater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so, an amphitheater. There's a coffee shop. It's yeah. half commercial, half residential. Yeah. It's actually what Tony Shea built. 
And Tony okay. Shea lived on the residential corridor oh, of that. Yeah, he lived there for Incredible. like two, I didn't three, know that. for like two, three years in the residential corridor. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of surround those surround the amphitheater. The grass Our area kind of goes yeah. up for great viewing of a stage they have in front, and then there's huge steps for like higher viewing seat, seating, and then there's straight up like an upper deck that they're probably going to use for like VIP. Mm-hmm. Um, and from my understanding, the capacity at this time is 700 people. Oh, I don't know perfect. if that's like COVID capacity. That's probably or... full capacity. Yeah. Okay. But um, it's dope. I'm actually playing there um, on June 26th. Perfect. That'll yes. be like right around when this re- uh, this episode drops. Yep. So that'll be perfect. Yeah. Is that just a solo act? No, um, it's actually in partnership with We The Beat. Um, I'm opening up for a special guest, which we have not announced yet. By the time this episode's out, it'll be out. Mm-hmm. But um, um, so wait, maybe we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah Kirk, Kirk actually mentioned in the podcast that <laughs> okay. you guys were dropping. But he didn't say the artist, so yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I could say it now because yeah. it'll already be out. Yeah. Um, it's Esta with Selection. Last time he was here, we um, promoted a show with uh, Selection at the Bunkhouse. And the bunkhouse, from my understanding, is 250 person capacity. I think it could get up to like 300 something with the outdoor area, um, and not everybody in the indoor venue slash bar at the same time. Um, but I believe that sold out. So it's going to be very interesting to see can we as a team um, sell out the um, Ferguson, which is basically going to be a little bit more than double the size. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to put my skills to the test now that I'm actually going to be, um, promoting not only a show, right. Um, selling tickets for the headliner. Um, but now I'm actually selling myself as a performer or one of the supporting acts, um, which I've never, um, really done before. I've always kind of focused on selling tickets for other people, um, and again, you know, successful at that for several years, but that kind of even brought me when, when the pandemic happened, I started focusing on my own music. I had an epiphany, like, why couldn't I sell my own brand, right? Myself, I'm selling tickets for other people. Let's try to now pivot to where if I'm on the bill, I'm also selling tickets for the show. And then also kind of putting myself out there at the same time. That is awesome. When, yeah. when are we going to see an L rich? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that I can, so I'm actually branding that one as L rich DJ set, Mm. um, because I am dropping a new EP this Friday, um, June 4th. So it's a little earlier than when this episode will come out. (laughs) Um, but that's like more up tempo music and it's not necessarily like stories of my life or more like intellectual topics. Um, the, the EP is called Party Music Volume 1. Nice. And it's straight up like up-tempo, like dance music um, that people can get down to while they're out and about. So I'm actually going to be spinning some of those songs on my set at Ferguson's on June 26th. So the likelihood I might pick up the microphone and actually get off behind the decks is is high. Um, we'll, we'll feel out the vibes at the time and see what's going down. But it is an L. Rich DJ set. That's dope. That's the way yes. that you separate yourself. That's like kind of like the acts that you would see at the do lab at Coachella people who DJ and also rap over it with their own songs. Yeah. That's how you really separate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not like anything new. I mean, uh, Snoop Dogg, he performs out here all the time and he does his DJ set. I think at like Tao, he was doing that mm-hmm. a little John, he's doing DJ sets when he's out here. Um, it's just an, so, it's, yeah. it's an additional tool in your arsenal yep. that you can just whip out whenever you need to. I like it. I mean, I only started DJing in 2017, mm-hmm. so it's been fun to have that. I mean, I played drums before and, um, obviously I was producing a little bit in high school. I'm getting way better at it now <laughs> that I'm putting a lot of more time and focus into it. But the DJ learning how to DJ was a game changer for me. Um, so shout out to Kyle Havens, um, and Kendall Beck. I lived with them in San Francisco for, for a year and, uh, they had a three bedroom apartment. I was selling tickets in that area for shows a lot and I would stay with them and they had a guest room. Um, I don't know anybody in San Francisco who has just two guest rooms. So I was like, yo, can I live in one of these? They gave me a great deal. And then the other room I found out was just straight up a music studio. And I was like, who... 
I don't know anyone that lives in San Francisco with three rooms that they're not like trying to pack as many people to save rent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like shout out to them. I lived with them. And then I got started DJing through Kyle, who I would ask him pretty much every other day, like, yo, can I use your stuff? To the point where he like, dude, you can just, you don't have to, I don't have to be here. Like, you just, can just do it, man. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Obviously you break it, you buy it type of thing. <laughs> it's, cr- it's crazy how throughout this entire conversation, you just see everything that you've done just slowly intersecting and now it's like all leading up to like yeah. this Ferguson I mean, thing and like now your event even, where even you're Kendall. using literally all your skills. Kendall was a friend back from UNLV too. Mm-hmm. So that's, what I'm saying. that's why that came, came around full circle right when I was traveling up there and then had the opportunity to actually move up there um, and experience something new living in San Francisco. Yeah. Life, life acts in interesting ways, but yeah. I've always preached that as long as you, as, as long as you put yourself out there, somebody is going to interact with you somehow, whether you run into somebody and they notice you from online or they DM you or they are interested in your music or your podcast or anything like that. Those opportunities are plentiful. So it's like, just go out and do it. We have to overcome those, those, uh, those boundaries that we put in front of ourselves, Right. Yep. That's what I've is. I, I, I've been telling people that, that are talking to me about like wanting to start a new business or, try this new thing is just like, all right, what do you have planned so far? Come up with just the general plan. It's going to tweak along the way, but the fact is you just got to go. <laughs> yeah. I would say that yes. the hardest, the hardest part of flying a plane is getting the plane off the ground. Huh. Once you're up yes. there, it's autopilot, Great metaphor. you know, <laughs> the wind can take you whichever direction that you need, but you just got to get that baby off the ground, man. Yes. And that's, that's the toughest part. But once you're there, man, it's tough for a second, but then you realize you're, you're in your, you're in your natural flight route, I guess, sort of speak. Yeah. So before we get out of here, I have one question for you. I'm okay. sure you probably already know what this question is. What does Las Vegas mean to you? All right. Um, Las Vegas is home, obviously born and raised here. Um, and for me, I think it's going to be the vehicle, um, for not only myself, but my family, my friends and my network to, you know, get our, um, craft podcast, music, um, businesses to the next level. He's just using our community, um, and the culture around us to really excel, um, to be citywide. And then for those who want to go beyond citywide statewide, and for those who want to go beyond statewide recognition, um, this is where we're going to do it, right? Our home and our people all together are going to just make it happen and, uh, spread the, spread the Vegas spirit. Uh, worldwide. We are. Vegas is an internationally <laughs> recognized city. No matter what city you're in or country, you tell somebody you're from Vegas and they're like, oh, what? Yeah. I remember that time in Vegas. Like, and the Golden Knights have a huge international fan base. It's only going to keep spreading. The city's only going to keep growing yeah. and building new markets and opportunities outside of just hospitality. A uh, quick thing, just coming back to like Vegas as home, Quick shout out to like anybody listening to this um, or watching this episode who I grew up with, it, whether that be David M. Cox Elementary School, Greenspun Middle School, Silverado High School, all the UNLV cats that we know. Um, and then obviously everybody that we're working with in partnership with the business and the music stuff right now. Um, thank you all so much for kind of accepting like my next move and helping me progress through this path that I'm trying to embark on. And, uh, again, it's kind of similar to us saying we're doing this together, but I really want y'all to know that I couldn't have done it by myself. <laughs> couldn't have put it any better. Uh, drop all your links, um, social media. Where do I send everyone? Yes. Um, everything's basically at this point going to be sounds by Leo.com or sounds by Leo. So Instagram at sounds by Leo. Um, TikTok at sounds by Leo and that's sounds by L I O. Um, and then my website sounds by Leo.com. That's where you can book for the studio, um, and see, um, more information on services for that. Um, and then the last thing is going to be spotlight entertainment. So spotlight's actually spelt with no vowels. So S P T L G H T E N T.com. Um, and that's going to be S P T L G H T E N T at gmail.com. And then sounds by Leo is just sounds by Leo at gmail.com. Very millennial of you to not put the vowels in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Had to make it somewhat different. I feel like spotlight's kind of cliche, but I just ran with it. <laughs> hey, 
works well. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. This conversation lived up to what I thought it was going to be. You know, we got to dive into all parts of Vegas yes. and our endeavors, but the most meaning is that I know we're going to continue working together. We're going to continue building the culture of Vegas. You know, me, you, Paul, Rex, everyone else that's that we've mentioned or didn't mention that's yes. on the show or you're working with. We're actually all working together behind yeah. the scenes, believe it or not. <laughs> Even people uh, you have had on the show that I have never met before in some way, shape, or form, we're working together. I just met Andrea the other nice. day at, the, at a Golden Knights game. Nice. Someone that Jake introduced me to and that we're eventually going to work together. That's so funny. I talked to on the phone, and then I ran into her sitting in front of me at a Knights game the other day. <laughs> Shout out. I'm actually yes. hanging out with her soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Super funny. Love it. Love mm-hmm. Vegas. Thank you for coming on, brother. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you. And thank all of you guys for listening. We will catch you next time. Peace.